and then then Melissa will mention uh, our uh, an, up, uh, an upcoming application that we're doing. So just a couple quick updates. So last uh, uh, December 9th, the day before the 75th anniversary of the Universal Declaration of Human Rights, Mark Ottinger and I were invited by the uh, Peace and Justice Center uh, and the w Women's International League for Peace and Freedom to speak in Burlington, Vermont. My focus was about how the UDHR became unanimously uh, recognized uh, partly due to the fact of Gary Davis, the founder of this organization, and his advocacy. Uh, and Mark's sp speech was specifically about the World Court of Human Rights and, and the future that could lead to uh, a peaceful, more peaceful and, and just world. So it was a delight to actually have those events. And, and uh, even CBS Evening News, the local uh, um, affiliate, came and spoke and, and interviewed Mark and, and Robin Lloyd, who was the... Uh, the um, promoter of that event. So that was one uh, one recent event that we that I could uh, mention. Um, and I guess, uh, Melissa, were there any other updates or you want to just go ahead and mention about the African Commission? I don't believe there are any updates from our last meeting, no. But um, but yes, we're, we're working towards an application to see if we can get status with the African Commission and see what perhaps we can start to uh, contribute to what they're discussing in that community. Right. And, and I guess once we do that, then we can see about observer status with the Inter-American Commission and the European Commission, which would be a, a wonderful way uh, to get the word out that we're trying to uh, promote a, a, world, a future World Court of Human Rights. Mm -hmm. Excellent. Okay, well, so now it's time uh, we'd like to introduce our special guest, Yasmina Gorshan, who is the um, Advocacy and Program Officer at the Secretariat of the uh, Coalition for the International Criminal Court in New York. She's also worked with uh, UN 75 and the UN We Need. Uh, and we're delighted to have her speak today with us and share her uh, expertise in uh, experiences in, in coalition building, since that's what we're really trying to do here, as well as in civil society meetings. So we, we're thinking that, and, and Yasmina, this would maybe be a first question that you could get to at some point, but you know, what, what do you think the role is of having a large civil society meeting, perhaps even in, in New York, uh, to promote the World Court of Human Rights before we even go to, say, the third or fifth committee of the United Nations? So that's something you, that hopefully uh, among your comments you could get to. So Yasmina, thank you so, so much. We really sincerely appreciate you being here today and speaking with us. Thanks so much. Hi, everyone. It's really great to meet you, to see you uh, online. Thanks so much for, for inviting me here. Um, coalition building and a coalition model is something I'm very passionate about. Um, I have been with the Coalition for the International Criminal Court for the last like six or seven years. Um, and the Coalition for the ICC, I think, is a really excellent example. I mean, I'm biased, but I think it's a very excellent example of kind of the, the power of a civil society network and pushing forth an idea like an international criminal court. You know, I think back in 95, people were talking about establishing a permanent international criminal court. And something like that was just so far off, like nobody could really imagine having such such a court. Um, so perhaps I could give a bit of background about the CICC and kind of our role in helping establish the ICC um, and kind of the work that we do now and maybe give a couple of suggestions um, for the World Court for, for Human Rights. And then I think, you know, I'll try and keep my, my remarks short so we can perhaps have more time for like questions and answers. Um, I think it'd be better to have more of an open discussion than me just talking at you all uh, for quite some time. So the Coalition for the International Criminal Court uh, was founded back in 95 as Coalition for an International Criminal Court. Um, and it really, the role or rather the goal of the uh, CICC was to kind of harness civil society working in and around international justice, international criminal justice, um, and bringing them together to come up with joint advocacy strategies um, and kind of speak with uh, more of a collective voice in support of an international criminal court. We were very active in the prep comms at the UN uh, in the years leading up to 1998, um, which was when the Rome conference took place. And that was the conference that eventually established um, the international criminal court statute, the Rome statute. The CICC also played quite an active role at the Rome Conference. Um, I think civil society is quite important in, in bringing forth um, you know, certain topics and issues that might not be at the forefront um, of government officials who are negotiating these treaties. You know, The CICC was essential 
and ensuring that the ICC had an independent prosecutor to ensure that you know fair trial rights were included in the statute. Um, you know, different things like um, gender crimes were included, um, victims' rights, things like that. Those things were kind of um, pushed forward by civil society, uh, and now are kind of instrumental pieces of of the ICC statute. So once the court was, or rather the uh, statute was adopted, the CICC also played quite an active role in getting the court to be active. You know, um, the court was, um, uh, the statute entered into force in 2002, I think, yeah. if I'm, yeah, if I remember correctly, um, in 2002. And our members uh, played a really instrumental role, especially those in um, uh, specific countries would meet with their government officials and work towards, um, you know, ensuring that the draft or the domestic legislation was aligned with that of the Rome statute and kind of overseeing the kind of uh, implementation and ratification process. Uh, so that was kind of a role that we played. And now we're sort of trying to make the ICC work better. You know, we've been around for quite some time. Our membership has grown. Um, we have now around 2000 members not all of whom are uh, active, but many of them are. Um, and we're really just trying to make the court as effective and efficient as possible, making sure that um, you know the voices of victims and affected communities are heard at the court. You know that's the kind of main constituency of the court. So um, it can often be kind of forgotten in in some of these bureaucratic discussions. So that's kind of where we are at now. Um, it's been a very uh, lengthy period of time that we've been working in and around the ICC. Um, so, you know, my experience, again, I've been with the coalition for the last like six or seven years. So I'm kind of in this uh, later period. I wasn't, you know, I was a child back in 1995. So I wasn't exactly at the Rome conference myself. Um, but I think just um, after having heard more about the world court um, I think that what's really important in pushing these things forward is also kind of the political environment and harnessing what's going on in the geopolitical sphere um, and really kind of uh, centralizing this idea of a world court um, for human rights and, and why underscoring why it's why it's so necessary. I think, you know, if we tried to establish an international criminal court today, I don't know that it would necessarily. Well, I don't know. Maybe it would move forward, but I think the kind of political atmosphere that we had back in the mid 90s was really quite essential in um, moving this idea forward. It was really something that was missing and something that we needed. Um, and of course, that was built on many years of advocacy by civil society organizations. Um, and I think that civil society plays a, a very unique role in moving ideas like this forward. I think it's important. Um, also to have as many diverse voices as possible. I think you, know, you can't really have just one organization pushing this forward. That's why coalitions I think are, are so important because they bring together uh, a variety of different voices, organizations working on different topics, organizations based in different countries with different priorities, so on and so forth. Being able to speak together as a wider coalition, as one kind of collective voice, but then also bringing their expertise to the table um, on specific topics, specific issues. So it's kind of why coalitions, I think, are, are really so important. You know, from our side, we are such a, a rich organization because of the members that we have. We've got sort of like larger international organizations like you know, Human Rights Watch and Amnesty International, but really some of the organizations that drive our work forward are smaller, um, you know, nationally or regionally focused organizations those that have very kind of specific mandates working on um, certain issues. Um, and I think that's kind of one of my, my biggest things is I think really representation and diversity is, is quite important because you can't push forward this idea, you know, such a global idea like a, a world court of human rights um, while omitting the voices of kind of the global population. So I think that's one, one key thing. Um, and I think thinking of uh, convening a meeting, you know, in New York or elsewhere, I think would be a very good idea. What's really important is selling people on this idea of a world court of human rights. And then from there, you know, you can kind of build your base of supporters, other organizations who maybe haven't heard of this idea before, but would be really, you know, keenly interested in in working on it. Um, and then kind of getting together sort of a base group of organizations 
And then from there it can grow. You know, you have a, another coalition organization who's interested in this idea, then they can share that with their members or their partners, so on and so forth. So I think kind of from there, getting the, the basics down, getting people involved, getting people kind of aware of the idea um, is really quite a good one. And then from there, you can sort of move towards um, advocacy with government officials, with you know diplomats here in New York, in capitals all around the world, things like that. Um, so maybe I could just leave it there for now, just kind of some preliminary ideas, but I'd be really keen to um, hearing from you all um, if you have any questions for me or any thoughts. Um, perhaps we could just kind of keep it more of an open discussion if that's all right. That's great. Thank you, Yasmina, for that uh, presentation. Uh, and I've been taking judicious notes as, as you're talking. Uh, so I, I, if, if everyone doesn't mind, I, do, I actually have a couple of questions that immediately came to mind and, and then I, I would really love to entertain everybody else's uh, thoughts or questions for Yasmina. Um, you mentioned that there are uh, 2,000 members. Are all of those members organizational members or are they uh, some individual members? H how does the coalition work with uh, who can sort of be a member, so to speak? So our uh, membership is uh, organizational, not individual. So we don't have any individual members. Okay. Because I thinking back because I, I was here I wasn't I wasn't a kid or wasn't much of a kid back in you know 1994 95 um I remember looking at their the, the coalition's website and I remember there being an opportunity for individuals to like give support to the ICC as well as organizations does, yeah. is that does that not still a uh, possibility or I'm not sure about that I mean as far as I know we were always a kind of organizational uh based membership um but it, i mean there's ways to also be involved with the coalition and our members without being um like a member no. organization yourself okay yeah so maybe not in this conversation but i'd love to, to if you uh, get a chance when you know later on to send us information about how individuals potentially could support the mm -hmm. the icc uh, mm -hmm. or maybe we'll ask you that question later but and then you also said that, uh, I mean, since there's already the International Criminal Court and it has existed for, what, 22 years now or so, um, how much power does the CICC, the coalition, have in impacting the ICC and its policies, uh, and how do you engage that power? Mm -hmm. Sure. So we have um, we have a formal role. We're recognized by the by the ICC um, mm -hmm. as kind of the kind of convening organization of civil society. Um, for the ICC. And I think that the ICC is a unique institution in the way that civil society engages with it. We are by no means the only organization to engage with the, with the ICC. You don't have to be a member of the coalition in order to engage with the ICC, but I would say most or many organizations that um, do engage with the ICC are through our network. Um, and what we really do is provide uh, information and access to our members. Um, just for example, the ICC has its Assembly of States Parties, which is sort of its like legislative arm, I guess you could say, which is kind of the the body of all state representatives um, or state party representatives that are part of the the Rome Statute system, and they take decisions of um, interest to the work of the court um, and the assembly itself. So this can be amendments to the statute, the way that judges are elected, um, the budget of the court. Um, legal aid policies, things like that. Um, so we kind of provide information on these processes to our members, kind of highlight these opportunities. Like if I know um, an organization is works a lot on um, victims' rights, I can say, you know, this discussion is coming up uh, within this working group, and it would really benefit from your expertise in the discussion. So kind of providing them with that opportunity uh, to address the group, share their comments or thoughts, use things like that. Um, so we kind of, I would say, yeah, make these connections between our membership and the processes that uh, are undergoing at the court. Excellent. Okay, great. Um, Joanne, I see you have a question. Yeah, I'm, I'm delighted to hear your uh, your summary of, of the history because I, I, I recall being a cheerleader for the ICC back in in 1998 and giving it having a chance to speak about it and then getting all excited when it came into you know official effect uh came into being 
Um, and there's this man that I can't remember who used to head up the coalition and he was a Unitarian and I'm searching for his name because I kept up contact with him. I, I, uh, he's a gentleman from New York. And is I it know, Bill Pace? What is it? Bill Pace? No, there was another uh, one. John Washburn is to whom you're referring. That's, yes, that's yes, that's Washburn. the one. Thank you. The ICC, well, Bill Pace um, was the longtime convener of the CICC, both of which yes. are worked yes. here very, very closely. And I assume he has passed because uh, we did have contact with him and then lost contact. And so I, I yeah, guess- Yeah, we lost him last year. And um, uh, that is the role I currently fill with the co-convener for the Washington Working Group for the ICC. And then Yasmina carries on the proud tradition of Bill Pace, et cetera, at the CICC. Ah, wonderful. Okay. Well, my question is, uh, you know, and I'm, I've been faithful to try to include their work uh, not of the coalition necessary. I'm excited to hear that it's still uh, in existence. And I wondered well, how you define an organization. Must an organization have a certain status or something to be an organization? That's one question. And the second is I, uh, I always try to follow their actions with regard to the war uh, between Russia and Ukraine and their identification of war crimes. I wonder if you could help uh, elaborate on that kind of work that's going on currently. Sure. So uh, to your first question on membership, I think that's kind of, it's sort of an open question for us. Um, you know, what exactly an organization is, is kind of, again, an open question. For some organizations, they don't have official registration status, let's say, uh, in their own home country because of, you know, security issues or, or the way that their country treats um, civil society organizations. So it's more on kind of the the structure of the organization and the way that they operate. So it's less of a kind of formal requirement. Um, you know, we, we, we say membership is open to civil society organizations or to NGOs, but there's no like strict requirement as to how they have to be um, registered in a formal way. You can just kind of be, um, it needs to be more than just like a loose association, let's say. Um, but I think it's more on a on a case by case basis. Mm -hmm. uh, and for your second question, um, we've been, of course, following very closely what's um, going on with the Ukraine investigation before the ICC, but some of the other initiatives that have been ongoing. I think um, you know it's been interesting to see all the different initiatives um, that are seeking to um, focus on accountability in Ukraine, um, and. I think one there was sort of a, a lot that had come out right when the when the conflict emerged was it now almost two years ago um, you know kind of where where is the best avenue for accountability is it the ICC is it a you know special tribunal that's being set up um, is it domestically things like that um, so kind of keeping track of these different initiatives and I think there's a sense that. Um, there's need for kind of cohesion between these different initiatives because you're kind of spreading resources, both, you know, people's attention, but also financial resources across these different initiatives that are trying to do the same thing. So sort of harnessing all of those resources and um, centralizing them as much as possible. There's mm -hmm. certainly more coordination efforts that are going on now. Um, the coalition is part of the EU's dialogue group um, that has several work streams. You know, there's like kind of a government work stream, a civil society work stream, and then one that's more involved with um, Eurojust and the ICC, kind of these justice or avenues for, for justice. So we're sort of involved in, in that initiative, which seeks to bring together all of these actors, um, kind of come up with uh, more efficient ways of seeking accountability um, for crimes committed in, in Ukraine. Um, but I'm not, I don't follow super closely the Ukraine situation, so I don't want to go too into detail and give you any wrong information, but that's some of the, the work that we're, we're doing now. We also have a very active, um, network of members in Ukraine, and they've been very involved for many years, um, kind of following the proceedings that, or the, uh, investigation at the ICC. Um, so we're in close contact with them and, and do our best to support them um, in the ways that they need. Thank you. <clears throat> Other questions from, I mean, I, I still have a couple more questions that came to mind as you were talking, Yasmina, but just, I don't want to go ahead if other people haven't uh, asked or other questions that you might have in mind. Yeah. 
Okay, well, while, while, while you may all be thinking about what to ask Yasmina. So um, I guess the first question is, uh, because we want to talk about coalition building with you, uh, you know, uh, as your expertise, but also about civil society meetings. Uh, over the years, I mean, obviously, in preparation for creating the um, ICC, uh, uh, the, the coalition had to have civil society meetings, right, to, to get people interested. Um, can you give us maybe a little bit more uh, background, if you're aware of it, of, of how that went, uh, you know, sort of historically, but also if you could give us maybe an up-to-date um, explanation of how this, the coalition, uh, the CICC, uh, either attends current civil society meetings, tries to have an impact on current civil society meetings with regards, obviously, to the to the ICC or our global justice in, in general. So those mm -hmm. maybe two aspects. Sure. Um, I think that's one thing that we do quite often is kind of convene our membership. And I think it's interesting coming from the perspective of the, the secretariat of the CICC, because for us, we're constantly trying to convene everybody together and we take a position of neutrality. So we sort of leave the kind of big opinions, let's say, up to our members. Um, we don't take positions on any situations, cases, elections, things like that. Um, and we leave it up to our members. So I think what's really important is also kind of having um, kind of a central convener, if you will, whether that's a person or an organization um, who's able to really bring in groups together uh, and pull together the ideas and kind of come up with consensus positions um, and someone who's really able to navigate different cultures, languages, priorities, interests, things like that. Um, I think that's always been kind of our strength at the CICC is having um, someone or a group of people who's really able to do this. And I think what's it's really important because you kind of get the buy-in from as many organizations as possible, kind of hearing what the priorities are, what's important to certain organizations, kind of what their red lines are, um, and what, you know, how we can kind of come up with compromises when two organizations or, you know, groups of organizations don't agree on on certain things. So I think it's really important kind of having that role um, and being able to kind of effectively engage a wide variety of groups. Um, I, Melanie, I know you have a question, but I, I wanted to sort of have a quick follow up to that. Yes, Mina. Um, so, so does the CICC either sponsor its own um, uh, civil society meetings currently, or does it choose pick and choose certain civil society meetings to to either have a representative at or, or you know a, a, as the as the coalition how, how does that work so i would we don't necessarily engage in um or we we do engage in some other kind of civil society initiatives but i would say the majority of what we do is convene our own membership and something that we do let's say in the last uh couple of years we've kind of had these quarterly meetings in which we call together our membership on a topic of interest. Um, and that can be something like, you know, engaging with the office of the prosecutor. It can be on complementarity. It can be on, you know, budget and resources at the ICC, something that we're kind of aware that is on the minds of our members or something that really doesn't have a lot of attention that we think our members should pay attention to. Um, and bring people together and have you know invited speakers to kind of share on certain topics, um, but then also just room, leaving a lot of room for dialogue. And I think one thing that kind of emerged from the pandemic was the you know ease in which we have virtual meetings. And when we have a you know a, a network that's so global and so international, it's way easier for us to convene these meetings online than it is in person. We do have opportunities throughout the year in which we convene our membership. Um, in person, and that's usually around another larger conference like the ICC's Assembly of States Parties, which takes place in December, or the annual ICC NGO Roundtables, which takes place usually in the in the summer in The Hague. So we kind of take advantage of those opportunities and, and kind of convene our membership around those. Okay, and sorry, one more follow-up to that, because sure. I want to ask it as it's we're sort of on the same topic. Uh, uh, when you have meetings, does does the CICC either in New York or in The Hague have its own office where you might meet in a big conference room, or do you go to like to the church building across from the UN, or where where do you sort of meet sort of on, on the 
logistical level, I guess, mm-hmm. a very, you know, sort of a logistical question. Yeah. Well, yeah. I mean, in, in New York, I think the church center's a, the church center's a big one for us because we used to have a pretty sizable office, but not one that could accommodate, you know, like 80 people, for example. So we would usually rent out space in the church center, um, other organizations that have larger conference rooms, sometimes um, the state will be able to offer a conference room in their mission here in New York, things like that. Um, but typically, yeah, we would ha- we would rent out space. Okay, great. Okay, thank you. Okay, so <laughs> I, Melanie, finally, <laughs> I'll stop talking for a moment. No, this is great. Um, I just wondered if you could touch on funding for coalitions. Anything you could suggest or any thoughts you have or what do you do? Or sure, so most of our funding comes from um, government grants um, and other foundations. Um, I'm not super involved with the funding. They just ask me to report on my activities and I report on them and somebody works their magic and sends it to the sends it to the funders. So that's kind of my engagement with it. But I think it's also certainly about relationship building. I think here in New York, you know, building a relationship with the diplomats here and being in touch with them about funding. You know, this is our idea. These are the projects we're working on. And, you know, how can we get in touch with your colleagues in capital, things like that. Um, and really just kind of demonstrating why the work is important, you know, um, how they can get involved. And I think it's also quite important to kind of find your champions as well, finding people and governments who are really quite keen on um, on these ideas and who can really take them forward, both in terms of supporting you financially, but also, you know, at the UN, for example, trying to convene other organizations or, or get other governments on board. Uh- Melanie, do you have a follow-up? Yeah, just uh, do you have a couple people working on, uh, do you have like a staff doing the funding part? I mean, is it like two people, three people? Uh, It's like 1.5 people. I think, I mean, as we all know, working for NGOs and nonprofits, everybody does a little bit of everything. Um, But yeah, we have, I would say like 1.5 people who are kind of really responsible for working on our funding and funding proposals. Thank, thank you, uh, Alan and Yasmina. Uh, Rebecca? Uh, thanks, yeah, I think I can come in on, on the last two questions as well, if that's if that's all right with Yasmina. Um, I think you're being a little bit modest, Yasmina, in the role that the CICC plays at the ASP and the civil society roundtables. Um, in fact, the, the CICC is absolutely indispensable to the functioning of, of these major events and much else that goes on throughout the year whenever the three principal organs um, plus the TFB want to relate to to civil society. So I put your recent summary, uh, Yasmina, I think, I think maybe has the up-to-date info um, from the uh, last ASP um, uh, in the chat there. And what you'll see is that the CICC is the convener for all side events and probably a whole lot else And it's a really, really more than full-time gig for many people who I I admire deeply and want to wipe the sweat from your brow um, every time this comes up. Um, But this is the way in which uh, the relationship between the court itself and the coalition has progressed. Um, And it is absolutely, to me, unimaginable to think of the court today without the coalition. Um, And on the funding issue, um, I can say more there too. Um, Here you had a really um, seminal champion of uh, the coalition in the form of Bill Pace, who for decades before Rome and the New York negotiations that preceded it, um, had really cultivated active relationships with the states that would be um, among the biggest uh, sponsors as well as, of course, with the the European Commission and the European Union um, and, and other actors. And it there have been different amalgamations of the coalition over the years. At times, it has been housed with different organizations. So currently, um, if I'm correct, Yasmina, uh, the Women's Initi- Initiative for Gender Justice um, provides a house, i.e. a back office, et cetera, 
Um, and previously, uh, WFM IGP um, had fulfilled that role. And there was a period of some transition. And I think we're still in transition a little bit. Um, but now under the, the leadership, again, of the wonderful interim convener, Melinda Reed from uh, Women's Initiative for Gender Justice. Um, and so a lot of the steering committee members also play a role in fundraising. Um, and uh, sometimes, you know, this is complementary to our own programming. Um, and sometimes it's purely for, for the CICC. And there's always tensions there um, as well, because everybody's in the funding game, basically. Um, and so having been in some of those steering committee conversations and, and been behind closed doors, uh, that's, I think, what I, I would have to offer. Um, and there have been difficult moments um, in terms of the stability and the sustainability of the organization. And I'm hoping that we're kind of out of the, the tunnel a little bit, Yasmina, and we're, we're into a, a brighter day. But um, there is the notion that um, I think it has always relied on a host organization to some degree. Yes, Mina, please, please come in <laughs> and disagree and dissent. No, no, that's that's correct. We've um, we've always been hosted by an organization, first um, by WFM, as Rebecca mentioned, with Bill Pace, uh, and now we're housed by the uh, Women's Initiatives for for Gender Justice. So it's kind of the the model that we've been using in the last few years. I think also, as Rebecca said too, with funding and. Um, I think it's it's also very cyclical. I mean, a number of years ago, we had a very robust team. We had a whole legal team of people, a whole com communications team of people. And there was just a lot more interest and money in international justice. And that kind of waned and we became a much smaller operation. And now it's kind of picking back up again where people are sort of interested in the role of the ICC, interested in international criminal justice more broadly. Um, so it's becoming a bit more of a popular idea. And as a result, there's more kind of money out there or governments willing to give money um, for this kind of work. So we're sort of entering into one of those kinds of periods now. Oh, David, you're muted. David, I can't hear you, but may I make a comment? Yeah, sorry, I was saying, Mark, I, I had noticed your hand before Claire raised hers. So, Mark, go ahead and then Claire. Thank, thank you. Uh, yes, Mina, it's great to have you here. You're a wealth of information and uh, very helpful for us. When we think and when the chief justices uh, whose meetings I've attended three times were involved in the design process, one of the questions that was raised, including by Professor Thomas Bergenthal from uh, George Washington University, the elder statesman of sort of public international law, um, his comment was, well, the work that we are doing is very good, but he's not sure that the world is ready. Um, I'd like to see if you might have a comment on that. Is the world ready for a World Court of Human Rights? But also from the supranational court standpoint, you know, one of the questions we get is, does the world need a third supranational court? After all, we have the ICJ, we've got the ICC. And in response to that, I think that the chief justices would often opine that in distinguishing a World Court of Human Rights from the ICC, for example, that the emphasis of the ICC in some ways is criminal prosecution, of course, for misdeeds that are you know, historic, uh, whereas a World Court of Human Rights would essentially operate in real time to try and alleviate the you know, real time human rights violations um, at a very, very large scale, and hence the sort of class action characteristic in our statute. Um, think Ukraine, think Gaza, mm -hmm. think, you know, things that are going on at the current time. And to then distinguish us from the ICJ, um, you know, raises questions about specialty courts. And, you know, some people think that specialty courts are a bad idea. But I think when you're dealing with human rights issues at a global level, and then when you think about the European court of the regional courts, the European court, the inter-American court, the African analog, um, the absence of a regional court in uh, in Asia, uh, you think about the need to sort of unify the jurisprudence, which would also, I think, be one of the important goals. Can you please comment on your perception about, I mean, do does, I describe it as the third leg of the stool of supranational courts. Does the world really need another supranational court? I mean, I think that there are certainly uh, gaps that are left by the work that the ICC does and that the ICJ does. I think they kind of have a, from my understanding also of the of the World Court as well, there's 
you know, they have different mandates and kind of different goals at the end of the day. And I think what is really important um, is, you know, providing that opportunity for those who were kind of wronged to come before a court and um, see, seek justice. I think, you know, giving the example of like, you know, Syria, for example, um, you know, what avenue for justice is there for Syrians at the ICC? There really is none at this point. Um, I think it's possible to try and amend the ICC statute as something that we have that's already existing and, you know, try and make it, um, try and fill those gaps and make it kind of maybe more accessible for, for certain groups or certain people. But at the end of the day, is that really going to happen? Probably not. Are we going to have Security Council reform um, that, you know, allows or rather takes away the power of the P5 to veto? certain referrals to the yeah. ICC. I mean, maybe not, <laughs> not in the, in the near future. So I think in kind of, um, in the absence of, of changes like this, something like a world court, uh, for human rights would be really, really quite important. So if I may follow up, um, uh, thank you for that thought. Um, uh, when we, uh, now that we've gotten some level of access to the campus, if I can call it that, um, through Melissa's work and David's organization has now applied for sort of us to be able to actually go to New York or I guess to Geneva or Vienna and actually access the buildings, talk with the delegations. Um, because the way we see it, we'd really like to sort of get one or more nation states interested enough in the process to sort of tee up getting it on the agenda to start the conversation. <clears throat> and, um, you know, we thought first that the U.S. might be interested. We thought that India might be interested. The latter was largely because we were there for the chief justice meeting. Um, I guess in our maturation, we realized that maybe the, those were unrealistic. And we've subsequently heard that, well, maybe people in Scandinavia, nation states in West Africa would, would potentially lead the charge. Um, do you have any strategic recommendations? And uh, I spoke with, um, I believe his name is Larry Johnson, who used to be general counsel at the United Nations, now teaches at uh, Columbia uh, UN Law and Practice course. Uh, do you have any recommendations in terms of strategically, now that we have access to the campus, uh, how should we prioritize our meetings? Who sh whom shall we seek out? How do we make an impact? Yeah, absolutely. I think one thing that's been really quite uh, successful for the coalition and uh, for the coalition for the ICC and the ICC in general is kind of the role of small and middle powered states, so maybe not going for, you know, India and the US, but maybe smaller states like, you know, um, Croatia and Ecuador, or kind of smaller states who maybe aren't as, um, you know, they don't really come to the front of your mind when you think about making huge changes at the ICC, but that's really kind of where it comes from. And I think finding maybe some of those smaller states, they'll be able to also um, connect with the other regional or members of their regional group. You know, if you get uh, a small state from Eastern Europe, kind of maybe getting them to mention this idea at their the group of their or their regional group meetings. Um, and kind of focusing on on some of those smaller states first, building up momentum that way versus trying to go for some of these bigger states, um, kind of these big heavy hitters, focusing on some of the kind of smaller and middle powered states. That's great advice. One, one final quick question. Um, in terms of, let's assume we can identify one or more of those smaller nation states, get them to sponsor us so that we could actually then have a an opportunity to be on the agenda of a committee that was considering a world court of human rights. Um, one of the questions we toy with is, and whom would we bring along? Who would be part of our presentation team? And it's always been my sort of sense that because of the interest of the world chief justices who in 2014 unanimously approved the draft statute that they helped create, um, we were thinking world chief justices. And we also know that uh, Jonathan Granoff who is the president of the uh, Global Security Institute, um, is a big supporter of ours. And he's also the uh, convener of the, the Peace Laureates. Uh, we mm -hmm. also have a Peace Laureate from Vermont from 1995, uh, Jody Williams. And so I was thinking sort of a small, maybe half dozen individuals 
a delegation combined, uh, you know, combination of a couple of the coalition members, a couple of chief justices and a couple of uh, peace laureates. Is that type of format make sense? Yeah, I think that makes a lot of sense. I think having somebody who's kind of like the you know, the big ticket name, if you will, um, somebody who can kind of maybe get your foot in the door, but then also pairing that with somebody who um, is more like on the working level, who can like fill in the gaps with all the information, make the presentation. This is what the court is answering all of the questions that um, they may have. So I think that kind of pairing would certainly would certainly work. Thanks. And that's the end of my questions. And once again, my sincere thanks for being with us today. David? Thanks so much. I just thanks. wanted to interject before we get to the next question. I just wanted to say that the, the small nations is a great idea. And Mark has been doing that in part too. But I like that you've said it recently because Ecuador is one of the nations that's on the Security Council right now. And it's a good idea to sort of bend their ear because they, they do have the international stage's eye right now. So if, and, and, and hopefully we can start to work towards that bridge building. Thank you for that idea. Absolutely. Okay, Claire, you're next. Uh, yes, yeah, so I was wondering uh, if we don't have to ask if people want to be a member. I obviously, just would apply to the whole world. For I'm sorry, for which coalition? Uh, for uh, Human Rights uh, Council um, uh, jurisdiction. For the, for the, you mean for the uh, our, the our draft I mean, that some our people, Human Rights Coalition, Claire, or do you mean? Yeah, some of people say that I I don't want to abide by the ICC because I'm not a member. Uh, but I'm thinking maybe with Human Rights Council, we could do it a different way and start off. It applies to the whole world uh, and don't ask them, right? Is that a possibility? I mean, I don't really know the ins and outs of the the statute. So perhaps somebody else is better placed to answer that one. Should, yeah, that's a good one. It's The issue with international law is that there's it's sort of like the nations have to prescribe to it in some way. So it, the people that are citizens of the nations by proxy need to have that prescription. So there has to be a, sort of a nod to it. I mean, it's not the same. It's not exact. I mean, of course, there's there are some things that come with the International Court of Justice and the International Criminal Court where it's mandatory. But at the same time, if they're, they're, it's not, there are some people even in, in the legal community, they're like, international law doesn't even exist, you know? So you have to have that sort of prescription to it or subscription to it. And what I would add to that is that um is essentially, I'm not sure quite how to phrase this, but one of the downsides, if you will, that's talked about um, is enforcement for supranational courts. And one of the antidotes to the enforcement problem is what I think I've heard described, say, on Democracy Now! by the executive director of, I think, Amnesty International um, or Human Rights Watch is the naming and shaming which is that you know in a in a world of ubiquitous instantaneous information just the mere discussion of let's say a factual context say the Gaza situation and the implicated parties whether or not they're actually signatories to the treaty and therefore sort of per se parties through that methodology um, under the statute that has been designed by the chief justices um, the court can take jurisdiction, you might call it in absentia, uh, over non-treaty signers and can, but at the same time, will give the non-members ample opportunity to participate, to participate as full parties. Um, and the whole idea there would be to sort of showcase what a 15-judge panel of a World Court of Human Rights believes that the collective body of public international law says about aggression such as Ukraine, such as Gaza, um, such as uh, Uyghurs. Um, and so one of the uh, the issues I think is it, it's a more open format in terms of giving voice to the underlying legal principles and applying them to the facts that are that are seen. So and Mark, I just kind of, if I can piggyback, sorry, Rebecca, I know you're, you're next, but if I can just piggyback really quickly, the idea is that um, smaller nations have had trouble getting to international courts and the United Nations does have like a trust fund or a special fund in place so that if there is an issue where there are people that, you know, that need to be named and shamed that perhaps maybe even coming from a smaller nation, smaller businesses or whatever else, um, there is a way to get them there as well that might be able to be rolled into that as well. Um, Rebecca? Uh, thanks. Um, I, I'd like to come in on the, the subject matter jurisdiction 
Um, and also maybe clarify Melissa's last point and apologies that I will have to drop shortly for another event. Um, for me, the subject matter jurisdiction of the world court vis-a-vis the other global institutions is, is pretty clear. So the International Criminal Court has uh, jurisdiction for individual personal responsibility for the crime, criminal responsibility for the crimes within the Rome Statute. Um, so genocide, crimes against humanity, war crimes, and the crime of aggression in some cases with some lacunae there. It only prosecutes individuals, and there is a very clear chain, uh, evidentiary chain that needs to be established that is quite profound. The International Court of Justice only adjudicates cases between states, and those arrive at the ICJ in one of four ways, either the grant of an or the request for an advisory opinion by the UNGA, either by um, both parties being treaty bound, um, by both parties accepting exceptional jurisdiction in this case, or by both parties accepting compulsory jurisdiction over contentious disputes. By conversely, the uh, regional courts of human rights have uh, personal jurisdiction um, over individuals who rights, whose rights are violated by states. So if you are within the European convention system and if you are in the inter-American inter court system, you're protected. I don't include the African uh, Court of Human and People's Rights because I think it's very problematic, but hypothetically the same. And so what happens to those citizens that are not protected by one of those mechanisms where there isn't the um, either the personal jurisdiction or the subject matter jurisdiction for the ICC and there isn't a dispute among case, uh, us states. That's where I think a world court comes in. Um, my organization also supports an international anti-corruption court, and I've put some examples in the chat of, I think, very effective ways that coalition has begun to mobilize, um, as well as an event that we did in the Carter Center. I have no idea if that video link is going to play. because <laughs> It just got sent to me today. It's like on, on Google Drive or something. It'll be on our website soon. Um, and so I don't see these in competition at all. Um, an international anti-corruption court, for instance, would be specialized with the said subject matter jurisdiction um, and will maybe have the ability to prosecute um, corporate actors in a way that none of these other entities currently contemplated does, um, and leaving out uh, a world court of human rights to really focus on other core human rights issues. I was in a couple hour meeting today and yesterday on the draft crimes against humanity treaty convention and uh, there was a lot of very specific legal talk about who would adjudicate what and um, what uh, use Kogan's norms would be baked into the treaty what reference would it be made to other conventions I find it very problematic to say that this uh, World Court of Human Rights would embrace states that do not ratify a convention um, other than with uh, uh, recourse to customary international law and use Kogan's norms. Um, and so I think it's instructive to look maybe at the Crimes Against Humanity treaty process um, as you contemplate the next evolution or the next steps for the World Court of Human Rights convention. Sorry, that was a lot. <laughs> um, yeah. And what was the last thing that I wanted to say? Oh, I want to clarify. Um, so the International Criminal Court, um, states and non-states parties cannot earmark for specific situations and cases. And individuals cannot do the same. Neither can uh, businesses or corporations. There is an entirely separate entity called the Trust Fund for Victims that has a dual mandate um, for reparations um, and, um, and rehabilitation um, of affected communities. Um, and that earmarks are allowed, but even that's pretty controversial. The United States not being a state party to the Rome statute has found some interesting workarounds in way to support the court, particularly with regards to Ukraine recently. Um, and these also are highly controversial. Um, so I, I would not say that it's possible to, as, as an individual, go out and, you know, put your dollars towards, towards the ICC um, in a certain way. Um, and for individuals who want to be more involved and engaged in discussions around the International Criminal Court, while the CICC is um, an organizational-based membership model, um, you can join the monthly, uh, much more informal conversations of the Washington Working Group for the ICC. And um, uh, David, and you can put my info in the chat or send me uh, information for folks who are interested in joining those. 
Um, and Yasmina and folks from the CICC often come and give us the, the, the substance, but we also have a lot of guest speakers. Um, for instance, this past week, we had uh, somebody from the special court um, for, for CAR for the Central African Republic, which is an interesting hybrid tribunal model. Thank, thank you, Rebecca, for sharing all that. Yasmina, do you have time to stay for just a few more minutes with, for a couple more questions? Yep, I can hang for another like 10 minutes or so. And anyone who has to, I know, Rebecca, you have another meeting to go to or anyone else who has to pop off. That's perfectly fine. Thank you uh, for being here. Um, Joanne. Uh, yeah, uh, I, I maybe Rebecca just answered this, but I'm not sure. Um, uh, bearing in mind, I've been a social studies teacher for many, many years and try to put in plain English, simple English, you know, for high school students, something that they could understand. ICJ is government to government. Uh, the ICC, you target individuals. Who do you, when you talk about human rights, what entity are you talking, you talking about groups of people? Or I mean, who, who brings cases? Who would be bring cases before? What, what simple language could you use that, that you could, you know, violations of human rights, but by whom, to whom, you know, what mechanism do you envision? David, do you want me to take that? <laughs> well, so, well, yes, but I also want, I don't know, Yasmina, do you have any thoughts about that before Mark maybe mentions what's actually written in our draft statute? <laughs> uh, no, I think I'd leave it over to, over to Mark. Okay, sure. So we have uh, something in the nature of a uh, U.S. Supreme Court model in terms of uh, in the nature of a petition for certiorari, um, as opposed to some of the, uh, one of the, at least the European Court of Human Rights, uh, the World Court of Human Rights, as envisioned, would basically take applications and then select from them those cases that are deemed by the screening panel, if you will, to be the most impactful, to have the largest, uh, let's say, class of individuals that are affected. Um, and so just as the US Supreme Court gets 10,000 applications a year, generally takes about 75 cases per year, you know, with this standard sort of certiorari criteria, such as, you know, it's a, it's an area of controversy amongst the circuit uh, appeal courts. Uh, you know, it, it's of large moment, you know, it's a significant question. Um, and so the cases are, would be selected, which I understand that in some other supranational situations uh, is not the case. Um, and it would be based essentially on the, the and the statute's very clear about this, the the number of people affected, the uh, quantum essentially of the effect on any individual, you know, they would they would be able to sift cases so they could attend to the most important. And then when they make rulings on it based upon the applicable uh, body of law, and there's a provision in our draft statute for what bodies of law would apply, um, they would thereby sort of fill out the jurisprudence, unify the jurisprudence among the regional courts and uh, and essentially de you know derive just as any kind of a precedential law system derives principles of law uh, arising out of the facts that, that give rise to the disputes. And so mostly class actions, uh, large impact cases as opposed to 100,000 cases per year. Thank you. Um so, uh, yes, I mean, I, I just have a quick question that the follow up to that. Uh, does the ICC, is it only uh, on behalf of uh, or against individuals who violated rights, but is it just dealing with government individuals or is there any kind of corp corporate or corporation responsibility at the ICC? I mean, because we've talked about, uh, uh, you know, as as we were drafting the the this new draft statute for the World Court of Human Rights, we were talking about, well, should it just be, you know, on behalf of individuals or groups? Yes. But should it be, uh, once again, just against governments or could corporations be brought into the court as, uh, you know, to be prosecuted for their violations of rights, human and environmental rights? Anyway, I, I guess, do you have a, an idea of how the IC, uh, ICC works, uh, you know, with regard to jurisdiction uh, individuals, governments, and, and corporations, I guess, is sort of the, the, the focus? Sure. Um, so certainly forgive me. I'm, I'm not a lawyer myself. I just work okay. very closely on <laughs> ICC and ICJ or, um, uh, yeah, international criminal justice. Sure. So um, the ICC um, holds to account individuals themselves. Um, and these are also higher ranking officials. It's not, you know, these like low level foot soldiers 
if you will, but really the ones who are kind of um, designing and implementing plans for um, for these mass atrocities. So it's on an individual basis. Okay, okay, that makes sense to me. Um, I, so uh, this is totally on, maybe more once again on on logistical question, and this would be my last question. And so if anyone else has a quick question before we we sign off for today, I really appreciate your time, Yasmina. Thank you so much for sharing all this with us. Um, I know uh, the you know the WIC, uh, the Washington uh, uh, Working Group for the International Criminal Court, has their monthly meetings just like we do, and their monthly meetings I think are one one week before usually the, the, the third week uh, of every month and ours is usually the fourth week on Wednesday and usually theirs are on a Thursday. I do have a a, um, a Zoom link from the last meet or from an earlier meeting. Is, do you know whether those Zoom links stay the same? Because if so, I'll put that in the chat for everyone to look at. That's I, that's, I think they changed the Zoom link if oh, I'm not mistaken. Okay. Well, so yeah. if anyone here on the call is interested in, in participating in the Washington Working Group, and you don't have to be in Washington, D.C. to participate in that for the International Criminal Court, because Yasmina oftentimes will give updates of what's going on with the coalition at those meetings. She did just last week also. Um, and it's quite interesting to see, because if you're more interested in what's going on, whether it's in Gaza and, and, and or Palestine and Israel or Ukraine, Russia, uh, uh, Yemen, Syria, wherever, uh, those updates do occur there. Um, but so is there, does the uh, CICC separately from the Washington Working Group either have its own sort of, um, you know, separate from your meetings with uh, members, other informational meetings, or are there other like, you know, uh, New, New York or LA or Paris or London working groups that that also talk about the, the coalition or, or, the, uh, or the ICC? Not really. Uh, most of our, or I guess all of our meetings really are, are reserved for, for coalition members only. But of course, we have individual members who, um, you know, put on their own meetings themselves. Like, you know, the Washington Working Group isn't necessarily a member of um, of the coalition for the ICC, but many of the participants are members of the CICC. So they kind of provide this opportunity for us to provide updates. Um, to other individuals, but typically the meetings that we have are are for CICC members only. Okay, right. And then one sort of big picture, final question for me at least is, you know, if you had some final words of wisdom from your years now working either through the UN or on the ICC, CICC, what maybe where we should, you know, what would be the next best thing to try to to focus on, uh, either from a coalition building perspective or or civil society. Sure, I think it's really just getting the word out and getting as many organizations and kind of diverse organizations involved. I think that um, your argument is certainly strengthened by having a wider coalition or like a kind of a big civil society voice speaking together. And I think also representation and, and diversity is also quite important. So getting organizations from different regions, perhaps those are, you know, mainly work in different languages or have different um, kind of key priorities or different mandates um, is really important, I think, in, in kind of strengthening the the impact of, of such a coalition. Excellent. Okay, great. Well, we've already taken almost 10 extra minutes of your time. So, yes, I mean, thank you so, so much for Thank being you so with... much. It was wonderful. Thank yeah, you we... so much for inviting me. This was really great. We really appreciate it. And if anyone wanted to get in contact you with you, um, do you want to provide so either the sure. the website for the the CICC or what would you like to share? I can share my uh, my email in the chat. So if you have any other questions or want to know more about the coalition or or the ICC, anything like that, um, please reach out. I'm happy to put you in touch with other organizations or provide so, more information. And maybe we can put that in our our, our email follow up just to say, hey, go ahead and reach out to Yasmina. Sure. Wonderful. Sure. That's excellent. We appreciate that. And then say uh, this, our World Service Authority is, as a human rights organization wanted to participate in the CICC. Do we just, is there like a form on, on the uh, uh, CICC yeah. website that we'd fill out? Yeah. Yep. There's a, there's a form on like one of the top tabs. There's information on becoming a member and there's a, a form online. Excellent. Okay, great. Yasmina, thanks again so much for your wonderful uh, expertise, sharing your wonderful expertise with us today. I really appreciate it. I look forward to seeing you at, at, at WIC meetings and potentially a, a civil society meeting for the World Court of Human Rights in the future in New York. Thanks again. Here. Thanks so much. It was great to meet you all. Bye. Good seeing you. Bye, everybody. Thank you. Take care.